Well, now to the issue, the big issue of the day, of trust and government. The U.S. government apparently monitored the phone calls of at least 30 world leaders. Chancellor Angela Merkel's cell phone has reportedly been on a U.S. surveillance list for more than a decade. In Mexico, many remain President angry Trump. over reports the NSA hacked into the former Mexican president's email. The Brazilian president said she was forced to postpone a planned trip to the U.S. following reports the NSA spied on her personal communications. No one is saying that you broke any laws. We're just saying it's a little bit weird that you didn't have to. Foreign competitors are saying you can't trust American companies to secure your data. 18% of people finding that their information has been compromised. 40 million credit and debit accounts compromised. Some data aggregators are collecting information. Are you at home? Are you in a bar? Are you eating? Are you having sex? It's less that they're doing it and more that it's done in secret, without our knowledge, without our consent. And I think when you have so much information being controlled by a secret agency, it is a real threat to American democracy. Don't think of us as an overly aggressive, paranoid superpower. Think of us as what anyone's looking for in a partner. Good listener. Privacy is one of the hot topics in our society today. On the one hand, you have governments spying on themselves and on all of you. And on the other hand, each and every one of you is giving away all of this information about yourselves on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And technology has taken us to a point in the evolution of privacy where we can never go back. There is no return. And, you know, as an example, you see this gadget I have in my hand? This is a small box, about $75 worth of parts you can buy on the internet. It's an anonymizer. It hides where I go on the internet when I'm traveling. It lets me bypass corporate firewalls and university firewalls when I'm speaking. And it basically empowers me to circumvent a lot of the things that watch us on the internet. But how did we get from where we were when we started as a species to having something like this that you could carry around with yourself? That's the journey I want to take you on. I want to take you on a journey through all of the historical evolution of different technologies and various historical events and, that brought us to where we are today and give you a warning about the fact that we won't be able to go back from where we're at. And that journey begins with a pretty interesting point some of you may have already figured out, which is one of the original forms of privacy. Uh, they're called keks or trues or burks, but you probably know them as pants. And you see, pants were invented at some point in time that nobody documented. But the basic theory is that somewhere in China around 13th century BC, pants came into existence. And after that, garments in general, shirts and jackets and all of the other various attire we wear in our everyday lives. And you don't think of these as privacy technologies, but they are. This is a basic form of privacy that each and every one of you use every day. Mm -hmm. And the problem with all of this was that the second story in our journey is how these became so popular that we had to mass produce them. And to mass produce them, we needed some new technology. And that technology was invented by a man named Joseph Jacquard in 1801 in France when he demonstrated the Jacquard loom. It provided a way, using a series of punch cards that hung above the operator, to automate making complex patterns. But it did something better. It didn't just make complex patterns. It also made stronger textiles. And those textiles were key in another invention, the hot air balloon. So hot air balloons are a very interesting thing because they're the drones of their day. They were used for military observation and all manner of things. And by the mid-19th century, they were also the equivalent of the backseat of a sedan in the 50s. Uh, but in November of 21st of 1783, something really great happened, which is two Paris uh, citizens built a balloon and they flew this balloon for the first unmanned tethered flight. And when they did that, they set a revolution off in several industries, one of which being meteorology. They were able to take instruments, barometers, thermometers, anemometers, up with them in the balloon, and they learned a bunch of great scientific facts. For instance, when you're ascending, the temperature doesn't decrease steadily the higher you get. And people thought about this, and they said, wow, this is really great data to have. But when you're in a balloon, you kind of run into some problems because you get all of the effects of being at high altitude. You get 
dizziness and lightheadedness and nausea, and they thought to themselves, what we really need is we really need a place we can study weather at high altitude without having to leave the ground. And they found that place at a place called Ben Nevis, which was one of the first weather stations in the Scottish Highlands. And at Ben Nevis, on October 17, 1883, when they opened, they almost immediately noticed a very peculiar effect, which is they filed reports every 24 hours. And if you were at Ben Nevis and you were filing a report about the clouds, when you stood on the edge and you were observing them, you'd notice that it did something very peculiar to your shadow. It created something called a glory, which is like a saint's halo with the colors of the rainbow, except in the reverse order. And in September of 1894, a young Cambridge physicist named Charles Wilson came to work at Ben Nevis, and he saw a glory, and he was fascinated by it. And because of that fascination, he decided, I want to make a glory for myself. And he created an invention that would forever change the course of our history scientifically. He created a thing called the cloud chamber, a really simple device. It had a chamber for air with a piston in it and a vacuum. And when the vacuum sucks all the air out very quickly, the piston drops and creates a cloud. Now, at this time in history, people thought clouds were created because small molecules of water attached to small particles of dust in the air. And so when Wilson cleaned his machine of all the dust, he noticed that he still got clouds. So he thought to himself, clouds must be caused by something different. And that's when, in 1896, he beamed x-rays into his cloud machine, and he took a photograph of it, and he noticed that it made clouds, but it made them in these very weird little streaks. And that's where he set off a scientific time bomb that none of us realized at the time, or even today, would affect every man, woman, and child on Earth. Because in 1911, Wilson showed a friend of his, Ernest Rutherford, the photographs of his cloud chamber. And Rutherford got very excited and said, do you know what you have here? This is a picture, a photograph, of radiation particles knocking bits off of an atom. And we're trying to split the atom. And that photograph made it infinitely more possible for another new technology in our story, a technology that could kill and help cure everyone on Earth. It could cure one of the worst disease known to man, and at the same time, destroy all of mankind in a blink of an eye. And that is the atomic bomb. And we demonstrated that on August 6th of 1945 in Hiroshima, Japan. And in August of 1949, the Russians demonstrated theirs. And that's when we started the arms race. And this is very important because this fed our technology and the pace of technology at an ever-increasing speed. And the US thought in the early 50s they needed something to defend about you know, when are the bombers coming? When would these missiles launch? And they created a thing called the Dew Line, a series of radar stations from Alaska all the way to Canada. And somewhere around, you know, the early 50s when they were doing that, they figured that they needed computers. And you remember that jacquard loom and those cards? Well, a guy named Hollerith had used those punched cards to do census data in the 1800s. And then he had formed a company that later became known as IBM. And IBM used those punch cards to program computers. And this is where our privacy takes an incredible turn for the better or the worse, depending on your viewpoint. Because this system could provide several hours warning of a tactical strike and several minutes warning of the launch of an ICBM. But what was incredible about the do line is that all of the data was transmitted live in real time to operators at Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado. So it was captured transferred, and it was one of the best and first examples of a computer network. And so the IBM computers there would process all of this data, and they would go through it, and they would dispatch fighters, that intercept bombers, so on and so forth. And what was really interesting about that was it was all military research that in 1953, thanks to a flight of American Airlines from Los Angeles to New York, changed all of the technology we have in our lives today. Because on that flight, there were two men named Smith. And when they got to talking, they found out that one of them was an IBM sales rep, and the other was a CEO of American Airlines. And as the IBM sales rep explained to them, uh, you know, we've got this system, it lets the operators get this data, and they process and make decisions. The CEO of American Airlines thought, this is exactly what we need to launch the jet age. Because at that time, it took about 90 minutes to make a reservation. And so they got together a few months later, they signed a contract, and about nine years after that, a system came into place called Sabre. 
And so Sabre is the original travel reservation system that took you from 90 minutes to a few seconds. Where are you going? What do you want to eat on the flight? What are you going to do when you get there? Where are you connecting? All of this data processed over this massive computer network that really revolutionized air travel because it made it easy to do. And it was also the first computer technology that was commercialized. And because of that, a bunch of other people got excited. So you look at the Dew Line and you look at Sabre, and they inspired another network project that has its roots right here at UCLA, which is something called the ARPANET. And in 1963, around April, there was a memorandum that was sent around discussing the need and the concept of an intergalactic computer network. And that concept gave birth to the ARPANET, and around April 7th of 1969, a company called BBN Technologies got the first contract to build the ARPANET, and one of the first universities they put a device at was here at UCLA. And so by the 1980s, there were all this interest in computer networks and investment. You could gather all this data on people. You could bring all of these services that took so long into such a short time frame that it really improved all of our lives. But that's also when the National Science Foundation funded a new network backbone that would become what you call the internet. And the internet has irreversibly changed our personal privacy, and in general, our concept of personal privacy altogether. And by 1999, privacy was so screwed up on the internet, Scott McNeely, the then CEO of Sun Microsystems, said, you have zero privacy. Get over it. And it pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> but now maybe you can see in summary that, you know, we, our need for privacy and the creation of pants led to the need of needing them mass-produced and the jacquard loom and how the loom provided these new textiles for balloons that allowed us to advance several sciences, including meteorology, and help start a whole new series of weather stations across the world, starting with things like Ben Nevitz, which inspired people like Charles Wilson to build cloud chambers and learn how weather and clouds work. And that, of course, took that famous photograph to Edward Rutherford, which inspired him to be able to split the atom and create the atomic bomb, which started a whole new best of problems for us. And the atomic bomb and the fact that we had everyone's, uh, that was a superpower being able to get them, created a situation where we had to have an early warning system of some kind. And that early warning system led to new computer networks like the ARPANET and the internet. And countless ways of both protecting and invading our personal privacies. So here we are at the end of this journey. And there's no turning back from where technology has taken us. And unfortunately, it's not going to slow down. It's going to go faster and faster and faster. And with a better understanding of how we got here and the internet dangers lurking in our near future, I'd like to ask each and every one of you how many of you are comfortable exchanging your privacy for security or freedom or a coupon to your local retail store? Or maybe I should put it another way and ask you, how comfortable are you sitting out there in your pants? Or would you rather have them removed for all of the world to see? Think about it. Thank you. Thank you.